All right, so this session we are talking about one media, many paths, short code versus toll free versus 10 DLC in Canada. And so I thought a good way to get started since we have a diverse panel here today, we've got the aggregator perspective, we've got ISV perspective. Um, why don't we start things off with Nate and why don't you tell us a little bit about, about how Attentive approaches these three channels. You can specifically talk about Canada, but if it's relevant, you know, feel free to mention the US as well. Yeah, for sure. I think it's probably important to go back to what we did in the US historically. I think um, you know, Attentive is, for those of you that don't know, a, a marketing platform for brands. And I think we started off primarily in the US and have battled along the way through all of the different shifts and turns in the industry. And I think we, as we look back, I think we're fortunate that we really started off with a platform that was designed around high volume, you know, high throughput stuff. And so we really, you know, started down the short code path. And that allowed us to set up a really good working mechanism internally for things like registration and, and building off of that historically. And we also started with bigger customers. So they could afford you know, to pay for a short code lease and kind of move forward from there. So we started off with short codes. It's been really successful for us. We launched toll free about two years ago in the US. And the reason for doing that from our perspective was really to go more to that mid-market case that we were talking about on some of the panels earlier of smaller brands that needed to um, you know, have, a, have a branch point into the channel. And, and that's been really effective as well. And I think we've you know, kind of driven volume through both of those channels, just so everyone knows. Today we're roughly kind of 90% short code, 10% toll free, and a handful of 10 DLC. And, okay. and frankly, like, I think we really would like for 10 DLC to become a bigger portion of what we're doing. You know, I think we've stayed away from it because really of two things. Number one, it's the operational burden on our side in order to go through the registration process. But the other thing is actually not just from our perspective, and I think as I go through a lot of what I think about on, that is valuable for this room today is actually the challenges of the brands and being able to explain to them you know, the, the differences in 10 DLC, what is the registration process, how does it work differently by carrier. And I think the thing that I wanna try to continue to echo as I sit up on the stage today is being able to explain those challenges to a brand who has no experience in the industry or understanding some of these challenges is very hard. You know, they are just stepping into SMS in general. It works really well for them, but it's our job to simplify it for them. And so anytime there's all of this variation, it makes it very hard for them. And I think in Canada, it was actually kind of the reverse. We actually kind of started with toll free because it was an easy branching off point. We didn't have to change anything in our system. And I think we're moving more and more in the short code path. But, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of differences there as well that I'm, that I'm sure folks on the stage will talk about. But that's kind of the, the marketing perspective. Awesome, and I think that you know touches on a couple of things that we talked about earlier today as well. Uh, you know, just the general knowledge gap that exists. Um, so, Paul, why don't you speak to those three channels from a Twilio perspective? Yeah, uh, yeah. So I, I mentioned it earlier, um, specifically to Canada. Um, we're, we're agnostic uh, as to short code or toll free. Um, it's just whatever works best for the customer and the use case. Uh, so we certainly don't push one channel over the other. Um, and I think the big challenge uh, is communicating to customers and them absorbing it. Somebody said earlier, like, you have to tell them over and over and over again. Um, but we're in the process of doing that. And um, you, so interesting thing about 10 DLC for us in Canada, it still is by far the largest messaging channel for us. Like, we send the most volume over 10 DLC into Canada than we do compared to short code or uh, toll free, that gap is closing. Um, uh, and, and right now, that gap is closing purposely because our customers aren't getting the reliability uh, that, that they need out of, uh, and dependability that they need out of that channel. So um, we absolutely would love to see uh, 10 DLC become an A2P channel. Um, and we wanna be a you know, a very positive part of addressing those channels, but that, those challenges. Um, but today we just, we really kind of like lay out what the differences are between short code and toll free. I touched on it earlier and, and try and tailor make it for whatever the use cases or our customers' desires are. And I think, I'm sure that's something that we're gonna touch on a little bit more throughout this panel is that, you know, is, how you approach those three channels in your client conversations. Does it really come down to use case? 
how does Cinch approach that with client conversations? Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, it's, you know, like Paul said, we, we sell messaging. Uh, we're a CPaaS provider, but, you know, certainly for my, my expertise is in messaging, and, and that's what we sell. And so it really does come down to um, what kind of things are you looking to do, potentially besides messaging? You know, we also do a lot of voice on our side. So um, what is that use case? Uh, what are they looking for? What are they interested in? And um, can we correlate it to something that we already have on our networks where we've seen um, lift, we've, we've seen a lot of traction, et cetera. So we try to steer that conversation, certainly. Um, if you're doing super high sending, you know, we might sway you towards short code. Um, if you want a local feel, maybe we're gonna sway you towards 10 DLC. Um, so it really depends, um, you know, some other differentiators might be delivery receipts or MMS. Uh, capabilities. So it really depends on what the customer wants to do, and then we can take them down this lane, this lane, or that lane. Um, potentially, we can offer other things because we do global messaging as well. So, um, but those questions also come up uh, in the global messaging ecosystem as well. What type of sender type do you need in you know X Y Z countries? So that's very relevant for Canada uh, as well. Yeah, absolutely, Caitlin. Yeah, can I just say ditto? I mean, it, it, your turn now. <laughs> so I, I would echo everything that you said. It's really use case driven. We don't necessarily have a dog in the fight as far as where we're pushing customers, but it's uh, the volume metric sending, sort of starting top down. What types of campaigns are you sending? What is your business model? So I think it's realistically like getting down into the weeds of the technical details is tough sometimes with customers. So it's what is your business? How do you make money? How do you communicate with your customers? And what's important for that? And I think once you understand that, it's, it's easier to advise. Um, obviously, we also advise with time to market, you know, short codes, toll free, 10 DLC, and that order tend to historically have been the, the most to least time to market. And so I think that's also important. Um, but it's also important to note that everything shifting, the industry shifting, the actual, what we're telling our customers is, is changing and evolving. We had a, sort of a consortium with some of our customers that have like use cases and traditionally those, those use cases had really gravitated towards the local 10 DLC because they have this very localized need. Uh, if you have sort of this geographically diverse sender base that you need to create that more personalized experience upon, the 10 ELC tends to work really well. However, some of those cost factors have shifted, and so we're seeing a lot of our customers really gravitate towards toll-free that have you know maybe more established brands that maybe would benefit from a local presence, but just from a pure P&L perspective, just are gravitating towards the toll-free channel. Um, so it, it's dynamic, I would say, and it's, it's use case driven, volume metric, it's really just what makes most sense for the customer. And Matt, you can provide a bit of a unique perspective, I think from the iConnective point of view, um, you know, messaging business that iConnective, I think used to have, doesn't have anymore, but what are, what are your two cents on all of this? Yeah. So for, for folks that don't know, iConnective um, operates and runs the short code registry in the U.S. on behalf of CTIA, which is the Canadian Telecom Association's counterpart in the U.S. Um, so from, from our perspective, it's all about neutrality and the use cases. Um, iConnective, we, and even I would say CTIA, we view uh, short codes, 10-digit, um, toll-free as complementary services. Right, it's not competitive. Uh, there's there's certain things. If it's high volume and and message delivery criticality, you know maybe short codes is the right choice for that. If it's a local presence, uh, for example, uh, my my cat was sick and the vet was texting me to confirm the appointment. Well, I know the vet's number, and so when I receive it, and it also gives me the option to drop out to voice to say, oh no no no, that date's not going to work for me. I'll be in Toronto. Um, don't worry, the cat's fine. <laughs> Um, or, you know, in toll-free, there's that, that um, inference of trust there because it's a unique looking number, much like short codes. So it is, it is very much use case driven, um, but, you know, iConnective does not, as Caitlin said, uh, participate in messaging. 
Um, we focus on the registry and trying to keep the ecosystem clean across all channels. Awesome. So we've, everyone kind of touched on some of the pain points, I think, across all of these channels and some of the barriers, registration, time to market, cost, um, just overall client or brand understanding of the ecosystem. Um, I don't know if there are any other pain points that anyone wants to, to touch on, but what I want to do is kind of shift the conversation a little bit to talk more about innovation in the space. So what kinds of trends, emerging use cases are you guys seeing across any of these channels, um, whether it's in Canada or, or maybe in other markets? And I'll just throw that out there to whoever wants to kick things off. I can take it first, I think. Um, one of the interesting things that I think is going to change some of the dynamics between how we choose some of these numbers is moving towards a more conversational use case. Mm -hmm. um, and I think going back to Matthew's point about talking about the, the, the fact that they know the phone number and building that connection with a, with a brand or with a provider on the other end, I think that one-to-one -one relationship is really important. And we've tried to approach that in a couple of different ways, I think. Many of you are probably subscribed to attentive brands and may have even seen the ability to save the contact card on the other end. So it shows up with their brand logo and some of those things. Now, that works a lot, and I think it works from a marketing perspective. I don't know that that has the same translation over to what we call our concierge use case, where you're having a conversation with a customer support person on the other end or asking about a product or really trying to, to establish a, a more in-depth relationship. And I think locality is part of that or understanding the business is part of that. And so I think that is not something that we have considered a lot when choosing phone numbers in the past, but I think we're gonna to start to see that more and more going forward. Is there still uh, an unknown or a question about how P2P and A2P are defined when it comes to either choosing a channel or, you know, uh, a customer potentially arguing that their use case is P2P and that should therefore maybe drive a different cost or um, that they should be using a specific channel? I think for us, it's still pretty clear that like most of the things we're doing go down the A2P route. Even that use case that we were just talking about, it's generally like a secondary thing to their marketing program or some of, the, some of those other things that they're already doing today. And the other thing that I'll say is Again, most of the people that we're talking to don't even know what the difference between A to P and P to P is, right? right? And so, like, they rely on us to be that that voice in the room. And so, simplifying is the name of the game. Yeah, I to, to chime in on that. Too, yeah. Because um, you know, we we have that uh, to what Nate said, the A to P versus P to P, and from the end user perspective, or even the customer not really understanding that and. In the US, there's been a bit of a shift with the messaging principles and best practices guidelines to now define it as consumer versus non-consumer. So even if it's a person texting another person, if they're doing it on behalf of an enterprise or they're acting as an agent, let's say political messaging is going to probably start up very, very soon, right? Um, that should be defined as non-consumer uh, messaging. Um, in our case, for Twilio, sorry, my mic's off. Um, in our case, we solve that problem um, because Twilio or ZipWhip is an ADP network. So, regardless of what the argument is, if you run traffic on Twilio or ZipWhip, it requires consent. It's considered ADP. So, even for political traffic, and, and I think where this is important is we've even had cases where the FC in the U.S., the FCC, or a class action sued in, in Canada has come out in the court say, well, they don't need consent to run this or they can send this and, and that's fine, you just can't run on our network. You need to establish consent and, we, and furthermore, we need to be able to, not just going forward, but, but be able to establish that you have consent going backwards. So when you think about political messaging, I think that's the challenge that, that, we're, that we face. Is one, we, we require that you have consent, but two, it's a challenge, okay, when you're, when you're, so you say you've got consent, but then you're gonna be sending to your list it's like, do you actually have consent for, for, for those people? So I think that's, that's we kind of step away from that debate, P2P versus A2P. And I just wanna go back to what you were saying earlier, because like, from an innovation perspective, um, I think the other area is, is 
innovating on compliance? Because one of the, th when we were answering the first question, nobody said, well, I choose this channel because compliance is different than this channel. And that's a good thing, right? Because we want compliance to be the same in all channels. We don't want there to be a scenario where I can get this use case through short code, but I can't get it through Twilly, uh, through, um, through tool free. It should be, it should be the same across all channels. But compliance is, is, is a tough thing. And if we can innovate and find ways to automate through the compliance hurdles, I think that would be an area we should focus on. We, we see that as well. We've had a lot of conversations um, with folks about having to register, number one, <laughs> um, and explaining that process and, and how you go through that. But um, we apply it across the board, the same you know, rules and regulations. And I, I think we're seeing that on many different levels. And I think that, like you just said, that, that'll be the next evolution is the spam mitigation uh, across all those uh, sender types so that it just becomes messaging and you're not so concerned whether it's a short code, toll-free number, 10 DLC number, you're applying the same guidelines, uh, I won't say the other P word um, that we're not allowed to talk about. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, just applying those same rules and guidelines, the same registration process, whether it's brand campaign, you know, et cetera, and it just becomes a seamless user experience. Um, no matter, again, what kind. And that's what I'm, I'm hoping for Canada as well, um, as they look to a, a long code or a 10 DLC solution. I think we talked about it on the prep call, um, is about the international capabilities mm -hmm. that international companies will want to come in and message in Canada, and they'll have a solution potentially to go to, um, as well as keeping out bad actors that might come in from uh, outside Canada as well. Um, so. I, I totally agree, you know, having that spam mitigation platform across all the sender types, the same registration process. Um, one thing that does separate it right now, you know, I think it's time to market. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, uh, you know, and probably volume as well. If I can just add to that, I think one of the other important things that I'm encouraged to see it is, is that DCAs and, and, and CSPs and stuff like that, I think we're starting to see a shift where they are understanding that they have to take more responsibility um, to support the ecosystem, so they have to do more. I remember back when we used to consider, you know, we're just a dumb pipe to the carrier. Um, so we're starting to see things where um, we're applying filtering on short codes now. You know, we do it differently than we do it on 10 DLC and, and on toll free, um, but we're no longer just letting those messages run on a beta to carriers. We're running in it in whether it be an analysis, analysis mode. But we're extending all the same principles across all three channels like you're talking about. Yeah, I would echo that sentiment. I think it, from a CSP perspective, we kind of had that same mentality, right? Where especially, as I think I said earlier, you're removed from your end user or customer by maybe two or three steps from our perspective because we have an enterprise business and we have a wholesale sort of reseller business where we empower other CSPs that then sell to other customers. And so that go-to-market model, you know, it does require sort of more ownership and education along the way. Um, so in that effort, I, I think we have seen some more, uh, it, innovation may be a strong word, but more attempts from our customer base and, and we've leaned in to start to encourage best practices like double opt-in and things of that nature, especially on the 10 DLC path where um, there's cases where maybe opt-in is debatable. And there's potentially implied opt-in, but in order to eliminate any kind of you know, future brand or you know, campaign issues, just trying to cultivate our own standards for what we're recommending our customers do for best practices so that they sort of can ensure that continuity of traffic over time. I think there's, um, as, as far as innovation um, with my fellow panel members here, you know, looking at their websites, there's been a lot of uh, devotion to educating with examples and case studies and use studies, things that, you know, didn't really exist maybe a few years ago um, to, to try and uh, explain the, you know, differences in, in time to provision or throughputs and, and whatnot, and even on the shortcode site, um, you know, we, the usshortcodes.com website in the US, uh, there's been a significant effort on educating the brands uh, as to, you know, what, what 
all A2P messaging or non-consumer non uh, messaging is, um, and how you can find a partner uh, to help you deliver you know, what you're looking for. So I think a lot of the innovation has been on the marketing side as well to, to try and educate um, brands that maybe aren't participating in, in messaging today. So I'll just say I think the pendulum swings both ways as well, right? We, we don't have a lot of brand representation here in the room today, so it's, I love that Nate's here. Um, but carriers need to understand what the brand experience is as well. And it's, it's our job in a lot of cases to convey that to carriers and be talking to them about like, hey, you know, that's, I mentioned it earlier, working together transparently, partnering. That's to me what it really is about. Like, you know, we have to understand what the carrier perspective is and, you know, how they make decisions and what the different variables are for them. And then on the other side, um, we want brands, we want to pull them into the ecosystem. We want more participation. And that requires listening to the brand experience as well. Yep. I think just to, to kind of close out that point, I think from the brand perspective, one of the things that I think is hard for us all to, to remember is it's very unlikely that any brand is coming in and saying, I want to use SMS because I want to just spam a bunch of messages out there and you know not get any engagement with them, right? The reason they're using it as a platform is because they're trying to create a better relationship with their customers. And it's also very expensive for them, right? They have a lot of other opportunities they can use that are not as expensive. So they actually want to be more targeted and have that approach. And I think helping them do that in a way that is efficient for them, but also you know, is, is good for the overall channel and for the ecosystem is I think everyone's kind of on the same page. There's, there's not a lot of like malicious actors out there, at least from a principled perspective. Uh, just being mindful of time, I think we will open it up to any questions. Oh, I think in the middle there, Susan. <laughs> Hi, it's Banu this side. Uh, so I just have a quick question about your business case when we talk about campaigns, like let's say political campaigns in the US or Canada, how does the, because, because it goes to the masses, so how do they opt in? How do they prove that they've been a part of, you know, they, they want to get those messages where, you know, let's say the liberal party or whichever party is trying to, you know, put, get their vote in, how do they, they, they show their compliance towards getting those messages? Political messaging is kind of interesting because it's not really a thing in Canada. I don't know if it's because we have such a short kind of campaign. There's kind of a six week campaign timeline before election. So I would look to Caitlin, David, maybe Nate. I don't know how into play. Yeah, <laughs> so maybe, Ka yeah. maybe Caitlin and David sure. to yeah, provide a little bit of insight on the compliance piece, and I, I, I assume implied consent that's leveraged for political messaging? Yeah, so it, it varies. Uh, you have a spectrum when you're looking at these political consortiums. The way that the, the way that business model tends to work is you have a candidate, or you have a political action committee, or you have a fundraising committee that's actually leveraging uh, maybe a consultancy, a marketing consultancy, and then that consultancy goes out and actually hires uh, a messaging platform that tends to specialize in political messaging. Um, it is a very specific type of messaging and it comes with lots of uh, red tape. And so that is sort of that business model. And in that ecosystem, you have uh, the spectrum of more compliant to less compliant. Um, there is the case for implied consent and that tends to originate from the actual politician themselves because they would argue, many of them would argue that if you go out and you publicly give your information and then actually participate in the, the democratic process that is voting in the United States, you are essentially opting in to receive information. Now, obviously we know that that is the least compliant form of opt-in and there are other things floating around the U.S. ecosystem right now, uh, the notice of proposed rulemaking is actually has been issued by the, the FCC in order to really tighten down on sort of that implied consent for the purposes of the consumer. And so 
what we are encouraging customers that are in that space are really to lean in towards the, the double opt-in. Uh, and, and in some cases where they're actually getting consent, especially if it's a fundraising situation where it's a, it's a, it's a individual that has opted in saying, yes, I would like to support this campaign. Yes, I would like to participate in your, your efforts as a constituent. Uh, that makes it, it, it easier. But I think it's, it's a good point. It's well-founded because in the US in particular, in about six months time, <laughs> we're all going to be start to receive those, those uh, messages on our handset. And so I think that uh, through further education, we're actually taking a, a very uh, strong stance here and have a political messaging forum with our customers that are a part of this ecosystem to help educate them on really what is compliance, what is consent, uh, really over rotating on opt out and helping them understand best practices there. And I think, I think, Caitlin, you touched on something that's important too, and something that I know we've seen in the Canadian short code ecosystem is that just because something is TCPA compliant or compliant with Canada's anti spam legislation does not mean you can do it in the A2P space. You know, it's something that might require a special exception or it's just completely disallowed altogether, and I think. Political messaging probably walks that line. Uh, David, any closing thoughts? I want to uh, be mindful of Stefan time. Heller has one more question. Oh, uh, I was just going to say in the political... In, David, in the, in David, you got to stop. I'm going to talk. Hang on a second. <laughs> 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 you can't see me because the podium's in the way. I know. I'm right here. It's, it's, it's a good thing <laughs> we're on video. <laughs> <laughs> It's a, very, it's a very quick point, sorry, to the, the last question, which on the, on the political side, and Caitlin's right. Um, not Caitlin, 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 the other Caitlin. Um, um, so uh, within the campaign registry, we have many, many, uh, many political CSPs that are registered to send political messaging in the US market. And um, there's a fundraising cycle that happens before the actual campaign launches. In the fundraising cycle, many people are using emails to do fundraising. And when th within those emails, they're actually using opt-in mechanisms to opt-in opt -in people to uh, receive further messaging after they've actually, uh, you know, donated money to a campaign. And so they have an opt-in mechanism that it's created, and they're creating better lists as they sort of move through the campaign cycle. And in this election cycle that's coming up, which is a two-year cycle, um, by the way, and of course this is the Brit who knows everything about U.S. politics. Um, the uh, <laughs> uh, the, the estimates are there's going to be somewhere between 8 to 12 billion messages in the U.S. sent, uh, political messages, from around, and I think Caitlin's right, actually it's more like three months I think we're going to start getting hit um, from things I've seen. Um, uh, so there's going to be a, a, a mass of information and um, there, there's a lot of specific kinds of, of campaigns that go out, like um, Get Out the Vote, which is telling people that they have a right to vote and that they should go and exercise that right. And there is some debate, um, is, is that a public service announcement? Or is that actually a message that needs to be correctly opted in? Uh, some would say both. But um, like I said, there's a lot of debate around it and it's a political messaging is a hotbed. Um, and there's a lot of people that want to get their messaging out, i.e. the politicians. And there's a lot of people that want it properly opted in, i.e. the carriers. So uh, between the two, um, it's, it's gray. But there you go. Thanks. That, no, you're right, you're right. It, the, some politicians don't like that answer. <laughs> All right, we are at time, so please round of applause for our, our panel.